Good morning to all of you. Um, it's one of those days where Brussels looks like fun. So uh, thanks for joining us in that room and not staying outside in some cafe. Um, welcome also to all of you that you're joining us via the live stream. Um, welcome to this launch of a study which looks at the flexibility needs of the future decarbonized European electricity system with a focus on the supply gaps which are longer than a few hours and the consequences with regard to the flexibility solutions. My name is Ralf Wetzel. I'm the Secretary General of EO Turbines and Eugene. Um, the study has been initiated by those two industry associations which represent um, the European manufacturers of dispatchable power generation solutions. And these are power plants that allow to generate electricity whenever you need it and as long as you need it. Now in Brussels, very often these uh, power plants are unfortunately branded as fossil, <laughs> uh, which is mixing up technology and the fuel um, because those plants can run on non-fossil fuels as well. If you look for a more appropriate uh, characteristic, I would say this is would be dispatchable or reliable flexible because this is what those power plants can add um, to the energy system compared to some other solutions. Now, EU Turbines and Eugene had asked Frontier Economics um, to do this study as a contribution um, of facts to an ongoing revision of the electricity market design um, where we had noted that there is a certain limitation of the flexibility discussion to the short-term flexibility and to some technology. Um, but flexibility has become uh, a topic for the energy system as we change from a world where you have the large power plants um, generating the electricity and adapting to the demand. And now we're going to a decarbonized system where the availability of the variable renewables are the decisive factor or becomes the decisive factor. So that's quite a change. And this study does not look at the transitional availability challenge. So it's not the transitional period that we're looking at, which is caused by the fact that we still don't have enough wind turbines and PV model, uh, modules installed that we need. But it rather looks at the situation in 2040 or 2050 when those capacities are supposed to be there. And the focus of the study is on the flexibility needs caused by the weather dependence of electricity generated from wind and sun and the seasonal peaks in the electricity demand that we will have uh, by electrifying mainly heating and cooling. So I guess without uh, spoiling already the presentation of Christoph, I can tell you that the study, which is based on the recognized data from, from ENSOE's 10-year network development plan, shows that we can expect regular longer periods in Europe uh, when even the perfect grid, when the intensive use of demand response and all available battery and uh, pumped hydro storage solutions uh, will be used, that we will not meet the expected electricity demand for some period. Now, at this moment, we are in a, in a high-speed political process to revise the existing electricity market desi design. And of course, that's mainly a reaction to the war against Ukraine um, and the impact on the energy market. But I think uh, it's also very clear that in the proposal uh, of the Commission, the topic of flexibility was picked up um, and there are a number of tools suggested to help to handle the upcoming flexibility challenge. Um, so the topics of today, the flexibility needs and the market design, what, what's the impact uh, there? And we will hear um, details about the study from Christoph Götzen, the director at Frontier Economics, who led the work of the team. And we will afterwards discuss with a panel of um, highly qualified industry representatives um, the impact of that. Uh, and I will introduce the panel to you later. But we are very happy to start 
with a view of Katharina Zikov-Magni. Katharina is, uh, as I guess everybody here in the room knows, the director at the uh, European Commission of PG Energy in charge of the Directorate for Green Transition and the Energy System Integration. And that um, includes the functioning of the internal electricity uh, and gas and hydrogen markets. Now, gas and hydrogen are just in the trilogue, um, but the electricity market design uh, is in a very hard phase. We've just seen the thousand something, I don't know how many exactly, uh, um, amendments suggested by the European Parliament. So there's going to be quite some work to be done to sort that out. Now, luckily, Katarina agreed to join us and uh, maybe give us an update on their view on this flexibility topic and um, some thoughts about what does that mean for the market design. Katarina, please. Many thanks, Ralph, and good morning, everybody. Very pleased to be here today to discuss a very important topic indeed. Um, okay, so you all know that uh, the Commission tabled the proposal on the electricity market uh, design last March. Um, the focus of that proposal had uh, three main elements. So first, making the ele energy bills, electricity bills uh, to of European consumers and companies more independent of the short-term market price, um, which often, as we know, is uh, driven by uh, the volatile fossil fuel costs um, that we saw in particular last year. Um, while at the same time providing stable revenues for those who invest in the new uh, low carbon economy uh, that we are transiting into. The second objective of the proposal was the deployment of renewables. And as you rightly said, these are increasingly uh, volatile. So we invest mainly uh, in solar and wind. Uh, and as we all know, they are not available all the time, even if today seems to be a sunny day. Uh, so that's where the question of making sure that we can have electricity 24 seven uh, at a reasonable cost where flexibility comes in. Uh, and then the third element was to improve uh, consumer protection and further empower consumers through energy sharing and similar. I will obviously today focus on the second objective. Uh, so accelerating the deployment of renewables um, and given the variation in the produ production, um, how to increase the flexibility of our energy electricity system. Um, so what is it? So we could define the system flexibility as the ability of the electricity system to adjust to the variability of generation and consumption, as well as grid availability across relevant market timeframes. Uh, sounds a bit theoretical, no? Uh, but if we think about it, uh, so as an illustration, so the daily and weekly flexibility needs are expected to double across member states between 2021 and 2030 and more than triple between 2030 and 2050. And this from our JRC uh, work. We have already seen in the recent days um, how in different parts of Europe uh, during the uh, sunny hours, electricity prices go negative where they have never gone negative before. Uh, so, which is actually maybe good as a consumer if you're on a flexible price, uh, but for the system overall, uh, it can be wasteful. So that's also an other ele element where flexibility could uh, play its role. Um, so, and then on top of that, obviously comes the most famous type of an issue that uh, has a German name, Dunkelflaute. Uh, so this famous uh, two weeks in the middle of the winter, when obviously there is no sun, and then suddenly there is no wind. What do we do then? And this is another type of a need for flexibility. Today, it's often uh, natural gas that uh, plays the role of providing this flexibility because it can be uh, ramped up rapidly and ramped up down uh, rapidly as well. And until uh, Russian war in Ukraine, uh, it was also reasonably priced and it was available. But we all know what happened uh, then when Russia attacked Ukraine and decided also to 
and stop supplies to most of our member states. So that's against this background. Um, we thought that it would be very important in this proposal to put flexibility also in the center of attention. Uh, and what we require member states to do is to assess the flexibility needs in their system in different time frames. So starting from daily to weekly to monthly, but also to seasonal. Um, and obviously the solutions uh, to each of these type of uh, flexibility need would be different. Um, so, and, and, and when doing this assessment, member states should look at all the possible sources that can come in. Some member states already have ample uh, hydropower, for instance, that can play this role, whereas others don't. Um, and uh, so the, also the solutions per member state will be very different. We also ask member states at this stage to only establish an indicative objective, uh, because at this point of time, we actually don't have the un underpinning data to say that you shall have X, whatever unit it is, in terms of flexibility, and even less to say something at the European level. So an indicative objective, also an indicative because um, we want member states to really look into this openly. Had we, um, and we had a discussion on should this be a binding objective per member state, even set by member states, and we decided not to, because, you know, in that case, maybe the member states would be prudent and put a very, very low uh, objective if it's binding. So we want this to be high and really in the center of the uh, analysis. Um, so we have then in our proposal um, also provided or us are requiring member states to look at non-fossil flexibility. And the reason for this is that today, already through the capacity mechanisms, member states can do any kind of flexibility. And that's often also where, uh, you know, today gas power plants come into play when there are need for uh, flexibility. But here we wanted to stimulate, to incentivize non-fossil flexibility, because in the long term, we need to have everything non-fossil uh, in, the, in the system. And here then uh, it will be up to the member states to decide how they will stimulate, how they will incentivize, how the market will bring flexibility or whether there is a need for uh, public uh, tools or instruments through this new avenue or through the more traditional capacity mechanisms. Um, so I think that is something, uh, you know, people often think that we forget about other types of flexibility than non-fossil. So wanted to underline that it, this is certainly not the case. That is already something that exists as a possibility. Um, so on, in addition to that, um, I think there are a few complementary elements in the proposal. Uh, so measures related to metering, which would facilitate demand response and unlock further potential sources uh, also from consumer side. Um, the reform proposes also to enable system operators to use the data from dedicated metering services uh, where smart meters are not rolled out yet. Uh, and consumers have the right to have multiple meters so that they can best uh, adjust their consumption uh, to variability if they wish or to continue having uh, a fixed price uh, uh, tariff uh, contract if they also so wish. But this should allow those who can shift load, um, if we think of households uh, who have electric vehicles or heat pumps, they can shift load to the low price uh, hours of the day and uh, bring flexibility through that. Um, so what will be key in all this element is also the complementarity between other Commission proposals. Um, so there are many elements uh, that complement and one which indeed uh, will start the trialogue phase uh, soon is the uh, legislation on uh, the uh, hydrogen and decarbonizing gases, um, which um, complements uh, the electricity market design uh, and where uh, well-developed value chain for hydrogen produced from renewable electricity with electrolysis will provide large capacity 
for demand side response. So um, the example I used earlier, the negative prices that we've seen uh, during the sunny hours in the, in the recent days, you know, would be fantastic to be a hydrogen producer and be paid for producing the hydrogen and then you sell it uh, uh, later on. So that kind of a flexibility also is an important element that we want to uh, see in the system. Um, so indeed, we are currently now in the phase where the hydrogen and decarbonizing gases package first trial took place and we will continue then um, on technical meetings and then under the Spanish presidency. We hope to conclude the file certainly uh, this year. Electricity market design, we are still uh, in the build-up of the uh, council general approach. We are optimistic that we will uh, have this general approach agreed in the next council on the 19th of June. There are a few elements uh, still uh, being discussed between member states. Uh, none of them really uh, impacting the flexibility part of the proposal, at least not in a, not in a dramatic way. Um, and then comes the, the parliament, which is shaping its uh, position still. Um, I understand the ITRA vote would be in uh, July and then a plenary vote in September. And then we would be ready to start the trialogues uh, also, obviously, under the Spanish presidency. Um, there also, I think there is a strong willingness from the co-legislators to agree uh, this year. Uh, we all need to keep in mind that then the parliament goes into elections sometime uh, spring next year. And if we don't conclude on these files, then they will be adopted by the new parliament. And that would be a long way uh, in the future. So let's all work very hard. Uh, also, when you provide your input to the co-legislators, be constructive, look for compromise solutions, and uh, which are as close as the Commission's proposal as possible, obviously, and then we'll get uh, there together. Many thanks. Thank you, Katarina. I'm sure it's not going to be a boring uh, half year, the next half year for you and, and your team. Um, yeah, so we understood flexibility is in your focus and that um, you nevertheless picked certain flexibilities where you wanted an extra push to be given. And I think we all appreciate especially the idea that you will see member states kind of analyzing and writing down what will be their flexibility needs in the future. I think that's a big progress if we really get this. Now, um, let's move over to, to uh, Christoph. Frontier Economics is one of the large economic consultancies in Europe and energy is one of the main working areas there. And Christoph is the director in the Cologne office and his team has quite some experience in the energy system modeling and in advising on market design. So that was the combination that fitted very well. So we were happy that they agreed to do this study that we're launching uh, today. It's not a few hundred pages study. It's the attempt to make it concise and short on 40 pages. Nevertheless, a uh, few of us find time in the busy days to read 40 pages. So that's already a challenge. So we're in the lucky situation that Christoph will now uh, summarize that in 20 minutes. Uh, and um, okay, maybe he needs 25, uh, but I can promise you it's interesting and it's um, not abstract scientific uh, things to, to understand, but very pragmatic, practical and logical steps that he will present to us. So. Christoph, please, and maybe we take the opportunity of handing over the first edition of the study uh, to Katarina. Yeah, thank you very much, Ralf, for the kind introduction. Um, I guess the topic is now spoiled, no? and my task is now to give you some of the boring numbers in the next 20 minutes, but I hope to make it still somewhat interesting. So in the marketing stuff, I also can skip. Thanks to Ralph. Thank you. <laughs> and then let's go directly into the number crunching and the fact finding. So um, as, as Ralph said, we, we want to try to make it simple and um, um, try to interpret some of the most complex analysis, which is currently around, which is the NSUE and NSUG scenario analysis in, as part of their TYNDP 2022. 
and um, the, currently um, the data is all available, so we took all the data um, from this TYNDP and we went through the different scenarios and then we looked into the gaps and the flexibility needs with a special focus on the, on the long-term flexibility. And for those of you who don't know this uh, TYNDP in detail, here are like uh, two scenarios. Both of the scenarios, which are called global ambition and distributed energy, they are in line with the Paris targets. And that means with these scenarios, we are in 2050 as zero climate neutral. So that's kind of the, the idea of the scenarios. And we have just picked like two numbers on the right hand side. You see the demand, which is uh, assumed in this scenario. And if we want to decarbonize our economy, we will have a strong push towards electrification of uh, various sectors. The heating sector, we heard it with like peak power demand in winter. We have industry electrification, but we also have transport, the green bars on the right hand side, which is coming up as additional source for electricity demand. And if you look at the numbers, I don't go into the details, you can say the plan is to about go from 2,500 terawatt hours of power demand in Europe to somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000. So in other words, we are adding in 25 years two times the power market of Germany. That's the size what, what we are adding here to, to our demand. And to cover that, we will also have to dramatically invest into um, solar PV, wind onshore and wind offshore. That's the bars on the left hand side. So we are about to six to nine times the amount of wind and solar we have today. This is the plan for the next 25 years. So this shows you the level of ambition which we have. And as we have heard, there will be times in the year where we have more than enough electricity in summer with not so much demand. You know, the sun is shining, lots of wind. That's not a problem. But we have, and that's the, the German Dunkelflaute word, there will be on a regular basis a couple of weeks every year where we don't have enough wind and sun to cover the demand. And if we go down a, a strong degree of electrification in the heat sector, the power demand will particularly be in winter. Uh, so because that's a huge seasonal business which is driving power demand. And here we have taken the data, or some of the data from the TYNDP. You see three weeks in January, we have applied the capacities in the year 2050, so the 2,500 or more gigawatts of renewables. And we have assumed in 2050 or 40 in the lower things, we have the same weather conditions as in, 2000, as in 2010. Uh, so we have taken 2010 weather data and have applied it to the situation in 2050 for two scenarios. The first line shows you uh, the distributed energy scenario 2050 no, for the region Germany, Netherlands, France and Belgium. And you see there's a lot of wind in some hours. We have the yellow bars with the PV. We have a little bit of nuclear. We have some runoff river. But still we have these dark black areas where we have to, to fill uh, additional energy into the system um, from whatever source. No? And in this example, we have 57 terawatt hours in a three week period for Germany, France, uh, uh, Netherlands and Belgium together, assuming this as a kind of a small copper plate region. And this energy, this 57 terawatt hours has to come from batteries, from demand side management or from some other form, maybe um, gases, um, climate gases fuel plants. We have done the same analysis also for other scenarios in other years. In the, mi in the middle, uh, you see the situation for the Iberian Peninsula. No? Here um, it's 2040, here the gap is a little bit smaller, it's also a smaller area and earlier. Or you can also look uh, at individual islands like Ireland, which, are, which have a particular challenge because they don't have the international network. And you see this situation is not something which only touches Germany or a certain region. This is a situation which is uh, occurring in every angle of, of Europe. And here we have done the, the analysis for whole Europe. We have assumed, which is an artificial assumption, we have a copper plate, so we ignore any constraints from any network. Even if we assume I can give, I can transport one megawatt hour of pre production from Lisbon to Helsinki without any grid constraints. Even then I have in these three weeks a gap of energy, which is not covered by renewables or nuclear um, or runoff river of about 100 terawatt hours. In the same three weeks, I have that's here in the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of now. Uh, you see there are two terawatt hours you know, in individual sunny days. I have a little bit of excess uh, energy, but it's by far not enough to kind of shift it with a battery to the rest. So I still have a gap of roughly 100 terawatt hours of energy or electricity I need to take from somewhere. You know? And in on top, it's not just the energy. I also see that if you look on the, on the, on the y-axis on the bar, we are talking about 300, 400 gigawatts of residual load. As a comparison, Germany has a peak demand of 80. Huh? So this is like five times the German peak, peak demand of today, which has to be covered post production of wind and PV. And the question is, how do we do that? And just to put this into perspective, what does that mean? If you want to cover it, these 109 terawatt hours in three weeks, 
if you want to cover it with uh, electric uh, cars, for example, vehicles to grid only, that would mean we would need 1.4 billion Teslas. And this is a pretty large battery already. So the idea we just do some blockchain and uh, coordinate all the Teslas of this world doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we only have 250 million cars in Europe today, mainly in the future less. And today they are mainly combustion engine vehicles anyway. So this will not work. If you say we do all everything with pumped hydro storage, the, one of the largest pumped hydro storage we have is in Eastern Germany, Goldestal. It has been built uh, um, in, in like or planned like for ages, and it's not so easy to add pumped hydro storages. We would need 12,500 pumped hydro storages to cover this gap. This shows you already it's not doable just by electric uh, using some batteries here and there and uh, or pumped hydro storage. We need molecules and some some bigger storages. And that's, I think that fits very well what Katharina Sigmund-Sigmund said. We need the batteries and the storage, the pump hydro storage. We we need them for the two to six hour gaps, no? shifting surplus solar PV to the evening hours. Perfect. Yeah, we need that. No? That that that's definitely needed. Um, we also need demand side management. No? So industry, we have to influence and uh, um, incentivize industry to be more active. They will be more active. At least I hope and what I hear, if the price spikes go up, because then they have their own interest and the the, the, the risk of like interfering with the production process, uh, which is their current focus, probably also shifts a bit that they see, oh, I can really save some money if I become more flexible and aware of prices. Yeah? That is something we need to do, especially in heating and cooling. But what we cannot use is using this demand side management to cover three week periods. Because then that means it's not about shifting a little bit of heating and cooling. That means we have to forego production. And I just know from top of my head the German numbers. The German industry sector uh, has a gross uh, value added of, of about 3,500 euros per megawatt hour of electricity use. So if we really cover this gap by just saying, okay, then we just stop production and we don't catch up, then this is a very, very expensive solution. And then it would be much, much cheaper um, to use flexible generation capacities from uh, climate neutral fuels. And then as an extra mix, uh, ingredients to the mix is the challenge that we are currently phasing out some of our dispatchal power. Uh, we, are, we want to get rid of coal and liquid plants across Europe. We have some nuclear phase out in some countries and we have nuclear, new nuclear plants in other countries. But as we have seen in the picture before, the new nuclear plants were already in the picture. Uh, still, the gap will be significant. And just to show you that this is not a trick, yeah, where, where I picked the year 2010 to make <laughs> to frighten you and, and then show this is a, a, a very special year, the situation occurs quite frequently. No? So the green line is the 2010 year example. In terms of energy, it is indeed the worst year no? which we have analyzed. Um, but you see there are like six other years, like the January in six other years or five other years. No? They are in terms of energy a little bit lower, but still significant. And if you look at the uh, on the x axis and the y axis in terms of the capacity the gigawatts needed some of the years are even worse than the 2010 year so this is something which will happen relatively regularly not every year maybe but quite regularly that we have to, that we have to think about it's not one in 100 years thing which you can ignore and then say no, i don't care this is something we have to be prepared for and i said the key thing is to have the gigawatts which is dispatchable controllable and hopefully at the right location in order to help with the network issues, which I kind of ignored here. No? So there are additional challenges which are not here. Um, and we have done uh, some kind of a check um, how much energy in the end will roughly come off these power plants and how often do they run. No? And here we looked into this. Now again, you see the residual load on the left hand side. The triangle is the time where we are lacking electricity post uh, wind and PV and uh, nuclear, where we have to add uh, electricity and the right hand side. These are the, this is the energy over a year where we have surplus energy. So only from wind and power and PV, we have more electricity in a sunny day than we consume. And ideally we take this electricity and shift it into the other hours. But as I said, you can't make it, you can't shift it from February to December. Uh, so that, that's, uh, so you can't shift everything of it, uh, but you can shift a lot of it. If you invest into batteries, if you invest into pump hydro storage, we can also use demand side management. And if we then just take the rest, the remaining gap no, with the gigawatts, which are the, the insurance and, and uh, um, the backup capacity, and you, you kind of add up the gaps, you end up roughly with 8% yeah, of the demand in 2050 in this scenario, which will then come from uh, climate neutral gas. No, and as I said, on the long run, this is not fossil, it's not Russian. This can be biogas, this can be an SNG, this can be hydrogen, whatever it is, it can be a mix. Uh, 
Um, it can also be maybe some fuels, which are like liquid fuels, a mixture of that, but it has to be some molecules which can store energy cheap and in a long time. Uh, and that is um, what we need here uh, on top. Um, if I, if I um, maybe sum up quickly, uh, we, I think we are seeing we need, we will see a big increase in power demand, uh, adding twice, two times Germany on the European power demand. The Dunkelflaute period will be quite regularly. Interconnection is key. Yeah, it's very good what NCV and others try to achieve with uh, very ambitious interconnection and network expansion plans. But even if we assume a copper plate, it's not enough. No, we, we have these regular supply gaps uh, with the Dunkelflaute. And then we need the demand side management, the batteries, uh, and demand uh, and, and pumped hydro storage. But it's just these three um, flexibility sources just do half the trick because we need something for the longer term gap. And I think that's something which uh, we need to discuss. And the question is, how can we ensure that these longer term flexibilities are there? And I think the first and simple thing is um, we have to just be open and honest that we need them. So we, there has to be a trust uh, uh, among investors that uh, this is a technology. If there is a clear plan to get this technology climate neutral, there is a fair chance and there will be a fair market environment to run these and invest into these technologies. Uh, and I think it's um, great to hear no, that there is an emphasis on DSM and storage. Good. But I think what we also need, and we have heard it already today, is that we must not forget about these longer term storage. Then the second thing is, I think, again, this is also a great idea is to really make aware the member states what's the need for flexibility. There are maybe one or two tweaks which we would do to the methodology. One is um, it's probably not so meaningful to do it on a national member state level because already today, uh, for example, Germany is uh, does swing supply with Austria and Switzerland. Now, if we have a windy day, we export to the pump hydro storage in the Alpine regions. If we have uh, a non-windy day, they deliver the electricity to Germany, for example. And I think doing this flexibility assessment in a yeah, regional um, context uh, would be helpful. And the second step is not to kind of earmark certain technology to a certain level of flexibility. So it's good to be clear what flexibility products are needed and then be technology neutral and agnostic and open um, as long as they are uh, carbon neutral in the end, um, which technology um, fulfills which kind of flexibility when. No? And don't prescribe this flexibility has to come from DSM, this has to come from batteries or whatever. There are loads of flexibility sources which we don't know yet, no, which will be in the system then. The other one is about, um, I think we will have a discussion later about revenue streams, electricity generation. We heard that if we go for an energy only market, we need margins and we have to live with margins because people have to cover their fixed costs and their capex. If we go down the capacity market route, no, then we have, to, we have to think about it, how to do it, how to make it technology neutral and also be open that these longer term uh, sources are, are part of the game. And I think something we will hear later on from, from, uh, from Sandra is that we have to pay ancillary services and do fair remuneration to power plants, which provide service to the network, which are not so obvious, no? for example, inertia or maybe even voltage control or frequency addition. The, the last point is basically the number four, which is a big discussion currently also in, in, in Germany. And I also heard from, from Katharina that we are already here also discussing it. And I think it's a quite urgent discussion that we make sure that the infrastructure is there. So even if we have a capacity market and people would like to invest into these long-term flexibility options, they only can do it if they have access to the green fuel at the plant gate in a structured manner. So you have to have the pipeline mm -hmm. wherever you want to build and you have access to some flexibility of the fuel. Because um, if you import, let's say hydrogen in North Germany as a band, and then you run these Dunkelflaute power plants, then you need a lot of uh, hydrogen on a short time yeah? and you don't need a band delivery of hydrogen. So this kind of discussions have to happen and uh, any investor in a power plant needs to have trust that the infrastructure will be there. Yeah? He will still be responsible to procure the hydrogen, but there has to be a credibility that the infrastructure is there to get it at the gate. Yeah? And the last but not least, it's not, it's simply written, but not easy to make is we have to rebuild the trust. Um, um, what we hear also from, from, uh, from um, potential investors that the, the discussions which we had last year were not so helpful. No? There were some discussions from Greece, also from Spain um, about market intervention, taking away um, uh, margins. No? And if you, if you rely on these margin, no? that then and you invest in a world where you say, I earn my money in a couple of hundred hours a year. No? And with that money, I have to cover my full fixed cost. No, then that means in that hours, there will be high prices. 
otherwise you can't cover your margin. And if you then have to fear with market interventions, no, then this is obviously a risk which some people are not prepared to take, and then we are in this capacity market state. No? So here we have to make sure if we go down energy only market route, we have to establish trust. If we go down the capacity market route, there are other challenges, no? but then uh, you have another way how, it, how you can um, establish some, some trust in the investment. And I think this is also a case or a, a topic um, from the view of the carbon neutral fuel producers, because from their perspective, they also need a, a reliable growing long term market. If, if we start thinking in niche and small segments, nobody does the first step and invests because if, and then if I'm then the third person to invest, I'm probably out because the market is so small. So we need something long term, reliable and where people can really see if I have a product, I'm a cost efficient producer of, a, let's say, green hydrogen, then there will be a market and there, will no, there won't be any political interference that this, uh, this market will go away in five or 10 years. So this kind of trust and stable regulatory environment, that's something we need to get quite quick because a power plant takes easily five years to build. And at least in Germany, I know that the time is running. Uh, so um, I don't know in, in all of the regions, but what I hear in, in other countries, um, it's not as um, critical as in some parts of Germany, but um, the situation will be more or less similar over time, especially if you close down uh, coal and lignite plants. So that's um, our conclusion from the study. Um, thank you very much for, for, uh, for your attention and for questions. Me or the other Christoph, we are always around for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. I think it put a very nice spotlight on the a uh, specific challenge of the longer gaps and we know flexibility and I think that's in the definition of uh, the commission proposal on the market design saying flexibility covers all time uh, frames um, from the very short term seconds to the very long term seasonal thing and everything in between. So I think our feeling was this more longer term aspect gets a bit lost in the in the views and that's why we try to to put the spotlight on there and i think you did that very well um now unfortunately katarina will have to leave us before the panel discussion starts but as christopher you were quite fast maybe we have time for uh, two or three questions to you and and to katarina if you still agree uh, to that or maybe you have a comment on the study that that would also be something where you it's now a good opportunity to to put it forward but um any direct questions before now we start the panel discussion that you might have here in the room please feel free uh, there's a microphone there will be coming to you i think we see one question down here Um, my name is Piero, and I work for the European Commission. I wanted to ask quickly, um, just one point is, how did you model the unlocking of flexibility on the demand side in this study? And another second question is, how do you see imports in terms of electricity, but also fuels? So maybe I, I start with the imports. So um, we try to simplify this, and we said, we, we kind of assumed the best pace possible, so we say, Whatever is possible uh, as imports, you, you exchange. No? So whenever is in one country some surplus, we ignore any network constraint. We just shift it over to a short country, uh, and then you balance it out. So it's a very conservative estimate. If you include the network constraints, the situation would be even more difficult. On the demand side, um, we, we didn't, uh, that's what we try to avoid, into go into these very complex nitty gritty discussion when exactly come to DSM, when the battery. We just wanted to show you the question is not how much exactly comes from demand side management, but you have seen we had like 30, 50 whatever, um, terawatt hours all over Europe in this period. It will be not be enough. And um, entering this kind of nitty gritty discussion, what is more efficient industry for two hours or a battery for six hours? And this is, you know, we try wanted to kind of get away from this discussion um, because as far as I know, there are not so many uh, industry demand side or demand side um, mechanism applications which can cover two weeks in a row without additional significant costs. And with demand side management, you have two things. One, first of all, you have the ramp up costs. Here we have go down the smart meter route. People will cover them once we have them. It's very smart to have the flexible terrace. And then we can kind of do the same service as a battery, you know, c covering two, three, four, maybe eight hours in a row. But we don't have so many 
cheap industry application where you can cover two weeks in a row. And that's what I meant. Then, then you are in, you can call it a, a brownout. Uh, you can call a brownout demand side management if you want, but in the end it's brownout and you lose a lot of money. And I, I said the German numbers is like 3,500 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, if, you, if you really do not produce uh, an industry, an average German industry good um, because you want to save one megawatt hour of electricity. And that's super expensive. No? And that's why we didn't go into this detailed demand side management modeling. My name is Benedict Herkes. I work for Siemens Energy. And I have a question to you, Katharina, to the European Commission. Um, on the turbine markets in Europe, over the last years, there was quite a dip. Huh? The market was going down, down, down. So all the sector was taking away people from the manufacturing to be profitable and to manage that, that crisis with many changes in the sector, Alstom, you know, Siemens, Siemens Energy, you have seen all of this. Now things are picking up again globally. Um, for our factories in Germany, they are fully booked until 2025. There's no single European project. And Germany, for example, wants to become neutral by 2035. And for this we need, I think at least the number I have, maybe a study has a different number, 22 gigawatt of gas-fired power station to, man to manage what was uh, shown here. The concern that we have is how do we get this done? In 10 years, no free slot now. We need to ramp up. We need to ramp up people. We need to ramp up the supply chains. We need to make sure that we can manage that load, not just we Siemens Energy, but the European manufacturers, if we want that this, what is needed, can actually come from Europe. And having manufacturing from Europe for Europe is high on the agenda. I'm afraid that we come into a catch-up effect, where now here with EU turbines, we are hitting at the bottom and say, hey, look, we're going to have a problem. But nobody's moving. There's no, our customers, no investment certainty. Not only because there is no money for fossil fuels, let alone certainty, how do we decarbonize that fossil fuel? And then at a certain moment, everything comes out and the Europeans cannot deliver. And so then we need to look in the world where can we get the capacity for the manufacturing. So my question is, is the commission aware of this challenge and what is your plan maybe in the next commission uh, to make sure that well, we have the market incentives for the long-term security of supply and more importantly also the incentives to decarbonize really the gas for that sector. Because in the Fit for 55, let's be honest, there's no incentive for greening the fuel for re-electrification. So is this coming in the next commission? What are the plans there? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think a very pertinent one and very important one. And I think for sure it is something that uh, we have identified uh, as an issue in the commission. I think the, in a way the Net Zero Industrial Act is a reflection of uh, the need to make sure that we have uh, uh, production capacities of various types of uh, of uh, equipment and, uh, and uh, infrastructure products in Europe. Uh, but how to get there, uh, how to get the investments done in order to expand the production capacity, I think is something that merits further thought. Um, in a way, um, what we discussed today here about the need for flexibility, different type of flexibility, making member states to set a target, even if not a binding one, should also create the certainty, if you wish, for what we want to see in the future. And then member states may put into place uh, also uh, um, support schemes in order to get all this done. So I think the elements are there. And I also wanted to uh, congratulate Christoph for the study, uh, which I couldn't say in my speech because I was supposed not to <laughs> have seen the study. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it comes extremely timely. It has very valuable figures, which some of them are actually um, you know, shocking, uh, if I put it very, very bluntly. And that is something that should also push our, you know, politicians, be it in the commission, in member states, uh, to take action, to provide the incentives uh, to, uh, for us to have the production capacity in Europe as much as uh, possible. Uh, for next commission, I think these are the type of food for thought uh, that should be fed into. And obviously, I, as a civil servant, cannot say anything of what the next commission may bring. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Katarina. I think uh, we now reach the, the moment where you will need to leave us. I think the, the point that Christoph made about energy system integration is something 
that we're also very worried about that it gets lost recently a bit. Uh, and I think this is in your area and we hope you can convince then the new commission to put a spotlight on this because that will help the energy system really to decarbonize a lot. Many thanks for your time and uh, for joining us. Uh, see you soon again. Uh, and uh, we're gonna continue now with a panel discussion and I would um, like to have the panelists uh, on the floor. So that's Christoph, of course, uh, who will join us. And that's uh, Sandra uh, torres Otis, uh, that's Marlene Oestmann and Dorothee Couchariere. Please join us here. There's no fixed seating if you just leave that one for me. <laughs> so, new microphone. Um, we have a uh, panel that really is competent on discussing now a bit the consequences and we'd like to structure it a bit on once again looking at the flexibility challenge then looking at this technology for flexible generation that we need to decarbonize and then look at the market design that's the idea for the next minutes um and um i'd like to start in fact um, with the first question to uh, Marlin. Marlin um, is um, working for the Finnish company Wärtsilä. Wärtsilä employs, uh, it's not so known in fact all over Europe, but it employs 18,000 persons I understand. Uh, and Wärtsilä provides solutions for the marine and for the energy sector and here especially engine power plants and battery solutions uh, for the energy system and Marlin has an engineering background uh, if I get this well and worked for Boston Consulting after having done different positions in Wärtsilä she's now in charge of uh, strategy and business development as vice president now Marlin has lived over the past years quite some time in Singapore I understand and uh, sometimes we have the tendency in Europe to to regard us as the center of the world and think we are the first ones to solve all the problems. But with your wider view, um, are there things that we can learn with regard to flexibility from other parts of the world? Thanks, thanks, Ralph. And that's a, a really interesting question. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so I've been been ten years in Varsila, and and during my first few years, I worked globally also with Europe. But uh, uh, in the sort of past five years, I've been based in Singapore and working mostly with the with the Asian markets. So now I've been six months in this uh, my current role, um, also a global one. So I have to say I'm, I'm sort of dipping my toes again into into sort of the EU market, and I'm sure I've got some some catching up to to do. But um, being here today, I think is a it's kind of great kickoff also for um, for diving deeper into into the European markets and challenges. Um, regarding what we can learn from other parts of the world, I, I think there's always things we can learn. Of course, I think Europe and EU are definitely ahead in a lot of aspects. And I mean, working working in Asia, I think uh, we also want to lift examples, you know, from from Europe to show on on, on how to do things. I think particularly on on policy and and, and regulation and so on. Um, but there's still sort of a, a couple of, of examples I, I, I could highlight. Now, ev every country, every region, of course, have their own starting points. So uh, when it comes to, to decarbonization, um, so it's not that it's comparing apples to apples. Um, but I think Australia is one interesting example. Um, they have a lot of renewables in their system. They have a, a liberalized open sort of spot market system like Europe with complex and early services markets as well. Uh, and there, I think it was really interesting to see um, in, in the last year how they moved, for example, to a five minute settlement period. Um, so they really sort of have increased, um, you could say, the granularity of the market, um, the visibility um, of the sort of price signals and sort of allow that. And, and uh, not saying that you sort of, you know, it, it's, it's an exact one to one that, that uh, Europe should take inspiration from. But at least what I found, it was really interesting to see that you see the value of flexibility suddenly when you, when you have sort of those five minute bursts as well. And uh, and we have a power plant that runs in South Australia, which is a 60% renewable uh, state. And at many times it sort of crosses the 100% threshold. Um, and, and there you can sort of see it operating in this very uh, flexible environment where you also have price signals that uh, that enable that, that flexibility. So at least that was a very 
interesting takeaway for from me. One example from from working in Asia, and, and if I mention another one that's a bit more broad, I I think it's um, it's curious to see that countries as different as um, you know China, Japan, Vietnam, they are also recognizing the need um, for flexibility and balancing renewables. You know they also are setting out sort of paths to net zero and. Okay, the 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 year and the decade might be different than in Europe, but but they are they are setting some of those plants and and they are, you know, seeing seeing that need and they're also seeing the need for firm flexible capacity, dispatchable capacity, uh, that was also highlighted here in, in Frontier study and um, in Barcelona we we are also doing modeling and, and across the whole world and and that's something that we see coming out in 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 all the cases and I, I think just the fact that such different countries across the world are coming to these same conclusions is also, I think, validation that, that we're onto something here and, and it is, is a crucial part of, uh, of enabling the energy transition. Thank you, Marlin. Um, maybe now let's, let's include uh, Dorothy in the discussion. Well, Dorothy is the European Affairs Director at Engie. And I guess most of you here know Engie. It's the French uh, company that has a lot of generating technologies and solutions in the portfolio from renewables to flexible generation and is active in quite a lot of markets, uh, not only in France and Belgium, as we know. Um, but yeah, I, I think with your knowledge also globally uh, and your experience with the different technologies, what's your idea of 2050, your best guess? What technologies will we really require? Will we be able to focus on a few or what will be the way forward? Thank you uh, for, for your question. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Now, I think, uh, as you said, it's not easy to be an energy solutions provider nowadays because everybody uh, expects you to, to have the silver bullet, right? And I think if there is one lesson we have learned from the energy crisis is that it's not good to put all your eggs in the same basket. <laughs> so at NG, we really focus on different energy solutions. Of course, as you said, we're a worldwide company. Um, we have huge portfolio of renewable uh, and we are increasing it uh, by four to six gigawatts per year install capacity and what we see is that to actually back up this increasing you know intermittent uh, type of energy production we need flexibility in form so a flexibility can be provided by storage uh, facilities like batteries for especially we talked about solar production for infra infra day you know daily uh, management of solar batteries are very good for more long-term uh, flexibility, like wind, for example, over a week, we need two different type of flexible assets, and and actually a flexible production, you know, so CCGTs and and greening it uh, would be, you know, one solution that we see uh, as a backup in the system. So we, as I said, there is no one single uh, solution that we look at. Uh, pump storage as well is a very important. Uh, uh, part of the elements, but as said before, you know, we, we kind of reaching maximum capacities in Europe. It's very costly to develop, very difficult as well. Um, and what we see is that in the coming years, uh, there is a big threat on flexible production. And I think the report is, is really timely because this is not really a question that is addressed currently by the policymakers, right? It's the kind of the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it. But the reality is that in the coming years, 65 to 80 gigawatts of flexible capacity will be decommissioned. Um, so what are the necessary uh, market incentives that we need you know, to ensure that we have this backup in the system? It's our security of supply that is at stake. So, um, so really, I mean, we, we look at all these solutions and we have proposals uh, to make it work. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's um, you know, a bunch of uh, short-term, long-term storage, flexible uh, production capacity. Thank you. And that's kind of the perfect... Uh, kind of uh, link to bring in Sandra as well. Uh, Sandra um, works for a German uh, TSO, transmission system operator, called Transnet BW, being in charge of the southwest of Germany. And um, now we, we say that's the elephant in room and somebody needs to take care of. It's the TSO that uh, somehow has the obligation to ensure that the grid is reliable, that uh, this is insured that we don't have any blackouts, brownouts, or, or however you want to call it. So um, that's exactly the question to you. And you're the specialist within your company for topics like uh, congestion management and uh, balancing services. So that's exactly where you're the expert on. So um, 
how do you see the challenge, um, especially in Germany, where you have uh, this situation where uh, you have an uneven distribution of the energy supply that is shifting now? What's, what's your view on that? How big is the challenge for you already? Thank you, Ralph. Interesting question, of course. Um, well, of course, uh, keeping the lights on is certainly our top priority, uh, even uh, um, in the face of the challenges ahead that we are discussing today, like uh, increased volatility, Dunkelflaude, I will even say a cold Dunkelflaude, when even this is colder uh, as normal. And in the case of Germany, the current uh, phase out of nuclear uh, and coal power plants. Um, but of course, we are committed to, uh, to address those challenges um, by, um, for instance, exploring innovative solutions uh, regarding not only grid development, grid enhancement, the a better uh, system operation and so on, but also looking at the flexibilities. How can we integrate them into the, into the system? Because I think uh, that th they are crucial uh, to achieve a clean, affordable and reliable uh, energy system. So for that, uh, I think that we are uh, we, we just use or, or taking a forward-looking approach. And what do I mean with that? Uh, let me give you two examples. Uh, we recent, recently conducted a study uh, similar to the one you performed, a little bit more comprehensive, um, looking at the uh, possible pictures or scenarios of the energy system in the, also in the year 2050. And from that study, we got uh, a lot of available insights regarding how important the uh, European solutions are, how important it is to make our system fit now and start now, but also the, 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 uh, the, the importance of, of flexibilities. And um, another example is the uh, mechanism that we are putting forward in Germany to really ramp up to drive the, the building of new reliable uh, capacity. Uh, we're putting that forward I in Germany. Currently, we're having this discussion because although we have these situations in 2050, we will have them in 2040 and I will say 2030. I mean, we're not that far away. We have to prepare right now. We have to start now, even yesterday. So, uh, of course, uh, we cannot do this alone. And uh, for that, we are engaging with regulators, stakeholders, other TSOs and DSOs, of course, to look for foster innovation, look at that innovative solutions, um, because uh, at the end to, we need to deliver. We need to deliver a secure s electricity system that the society is expecting. Thank you. Um, now, I think the, the challenge in Germany indeed is very specific in the sense that you have this situation where you shut down um, coal and nuclear, which is a lot placed in the south where there's also a big amount of demand and then you have the um, renewables very often located in, in the north. So you, you have a grid limitation at the moment where you can't transport um, enough electricity from, from north to south. So the study uh, assumes what's called the copper plate approach saying there's no grid uh, restriction. Um, we can transport everything uh, whenever we need it from everywhere to every place. Um, so uh, Christoph, I think you made a study as well specifically for Germany. Uh, are there any lessons when it comes to flexibility that, uh, and, and, and to the grid development where you would want to highlight uh, that there is additional challenge with regard to grid? Yeah, thank you. I think the, the message still holds. No? As you say, it's just in reality much more complex. No? So we intentionally simplified it here for the study. But as you, as you correctly described, in Germany, the situation is you have the north-south grid constraint, you have the phase out of the nuclear plants, and that's maybe also one region why Germany now a little bit faster with the power plant strategy, no? so which is about to come soon. We've um, issued from the Green Minister of Economy, who probably starts worrying now a bit that if we have auctioning to close down co uh, coal plants, we have a clear plan to nickelite phase out. We have just closed our nuclear plants and, and the wind farms are majorly in, in the North Sea or up to come in the North Sea or at the coast. Uh, and then so far, put it a little bit exaggerating, the plan of Bavaria is to 
build some PV. Ne? That this is probably not a, a, a fully thought through concept to, to run uh, heat pumps in Bavaria. Uh, with PV is quite obvious. No? So we need to have a strong link between uh, within Germany with our neighbors. Uh, and in addition to that, we need these power plants. And uh, this has now, I would say, is come common sense. And the uh, German power plant strategy says that we want to build 25 gigawatts of additional new power plants in, in the coming years. Uh, many of that will be directly based on hydrogen, where we have the energy integration question, which is also highly discussed currently about do we want to um, have state-owned uh, um, uh, hydrogen networks or not. No, this discussion has happened. No? But I think the, that's the good news um, of the last week that some people now seem to have understood how, how quick we have to uh, and how long these uh, time periods are to get really some some big infrastructure into real life in Germany. Uh, and I would fully copy what, what Sandra said. We are behind schedule. No? We have to hurry and clarify who builds the networks, who pays for it, what what are certification rules for green hydrogen, can we live with blue hydrogen, uh, uh, is the availability of the fuel in line with the taxonomy uh, uh, rules. All these things are practical issues uh, in combination with um, uh, like environmental approval things, uh, which is not just a plant, it also means I need a network both to get the hydrogen, but I also need a network to get the electricity to somewhere else. Uh, so it's not just the power plant, it's all the rest of infrastructure and currently we are seeing gaps in every part of the supply chain. And that is an issue. If we keep going like that, I'm pretty sure we will not meet our targets. Ne? And then probably the other countries which you mentioned in Asia, they are more honest. Ne? Maybe they <laughs> they will be quicker than us, even though their plan is kind of 10 years behind. Ne? And that's a risk I see. Thank you. Now, before we come to this discussion about how do we incentivize those investments, maybe let's look at the other flexibility options. Now, I think we have agreed there is need for flexibility now um i think it's a it's a popular assumption to say well uh the flexibility will be provided by the battery storage and by a better grid uh so interconnectors that help us and some demand uh response now is the Grid expansion, that's Sandra, maybe uh, a question going in your direction, is the grid expansion and is the building of the interconnectors, which is a big topic for, for NCOE, is that on track, would you say, um, that's working? <laughs> Uh, well, um, I would say yes. We have the plans. We have. We uh, there is. Uh, there are some processes that we follow, because of course the the investment needed for those uh, for those assets it's large, of course, and the the society is paying for that. You and me were paying for that. So the the uh, the government has to be sure that we are uh, using that, putting that money uh, in a good in a good assets uh, and following all the um, requirements for, for that. But in that way, uh, we are just. Um, making the whole process a little bit more complex. It takes a lot of time um, in, in some places, uh, in some countries, I mean, not only Germany, permitting uh, and building, it, it, is, uh, um, it takes time in other, in other countries even longer. So time is really an issue uh, because of different factors. So I think at least in Germany right now, we are, uh, um, we are, we are having or, or trying to implement a new German speed. Uh, that's also work. Uh, because we're trying to be a little bit more pra pragmatic, try to decrease bureaucratization. Because as I mentioned before, we already have the plans. We know we, are, we made all those analyses, cost-benefit analyses, and we know that we need the grid. But it takes time. And uh, yes, we are, we are a little bit behind the schedule. We have to say it. It is known. But I think that uh, with this kind of shock uh, in the last years, there is a new awareness in the society, in the government, to try to be a little bit more pragmatic, maybe like in other countries, uh, to speed up the process. I think that uh, I, I am positive, I'm, I'm looking, um, I am optimistic uh, of, the, of, the f of the future devel development in that direction. Thank you, Sandra. Um, and let's maybe look next at the batteries. I think the batteries are <laughs> of course attractive because it would say we uh, store electricity as electricity because when we have to transform it into molecules we have losses and whatever so there's always of course the idea ideally we could store it in batteries and use it to f provide the necessary flexibility and maybe here Malin the question to you now you have that comparison because your company is in both areas how would you differentiate or could 
if we just invest enough, batteries do it all? Of, of course, battery energy storage will be a you know play a big part of the solution, and 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 they're you know definitely needed. But I think also going back to the comment here, there's no one silver bullet, and I think that's that's what we're uh, what we're noticing. So in in Varsila, we we view our our technologies as complementary. Um, there is a certain overlap in terms of the jobs they can do, um, but batteries, of course, have, have strengths, especially on the you know millisecond second response, you know frequency control support and, and all of that. Um, and then you know dispatchable capacity that's not energy constrained and then has a strength also at the sort of other other end of the spectrum, the renewable droughts or Dunkel Flauta or the, the longer periods as well. Um, I think you see if you if you model. Um, and, and you assume that you would all do it all with, with renewables and batteries, that would lead to a huge overbuilding of the system, which is not cost optimal and um, probably would not be very environmental either in, in terms of just the amount of additional renewables and, and batteries and metals that, that you sort of put on the ground to cover those, those moments as well. And even more to that, I have to say, I, I really liked your, your point, Christoph, of, uh, of not linking the technology to the job to be done. And I think this is really important um, because we will we we don't have the entire sort of you know rule book we may not see even see all of the the solutions so it's it's really important not to sort of close doors prematurely and, and say okay for this job you you need batteries for this job you know you you have something else so there's a lot of jobs to be done when we talk about flexibility and supporting the energy transition and and enabling you know uh, a renewable baseload system uh, it's everything from their sort of really fast response, you know, frequency control, um, I think inertia and, and voltage control were, was mentioned. It's, you know, the, the minute to minute balancing, uh, you know, intraday, day to day, week to week. And then of course the, the seasonal aspects as well. And, and, you know, there's technologies that can play in multiple uh, of these spaces. Um, and, you know, our plants as well can start up in, you know, in, in, in two minutes and, and provide power. So there's certainly an overlap there with, with value that batteries can provide as well. And I think as a system, we will get the, get the greatest value of flexibility if we think of it more that what are the functions, what are the jobs that need to get done, uh, and then have some incentive mechanism, some, some revenue streams uh, for those jobs. And then you can have a mix of technologies and you can have an efficient market and you can have investors that, um, you know, invest in a mix of technologies and can make their own strategies. And that's going to be both the cost optimal one, but I also think it's going to be the ultimately the one that sort of gets away with the lowest environmental footprint and the most efficient system. And maybe just to highlight an example, we, we also have customers that in, uh, invested both in our engine plants and in our battery uh, storage plants next to each other. And, and they don't either see sort of a, um, a competition there. So we need multiple solutions. Thank you. And, and maybe now, Dorothea, I'm asking you a question that you can't answer because it's not your, your, your task. But how does an operator of generation solutions and storage decide on this is now the one i'm going for the battery here and invest in that and or i'm building a plant so uh, any idea but maybe that's an unfair question at the moment because uh, yeah but i mean i couldn't agree more with what my colleague from Vertila said i think it really depends on many factors right what you expect it the technology to provide and also what's the market conditions for the technology to provide what you expect the technology to provide <laughs> so it's a uh, so it really depends um i think for for batteries it's clear that we, we see a lot of potential um but also the incentive market incentive to batteries is not really clear at the moment you know uh, i mean there is a framework in the eu but could should could be incentivized still so it's we're still you know trying to define in which country would, would be the best technology to provide the necessary necessary flexibility that we need um so it's i can't answer with just one <laughs> single yeah. answer to your question so it very much depends on, on the market uh, conditions and 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 the service that we need to provide um but anyway on, on batteries as i said before I, I think we see potential but we need also to provide flexibility not only daily weekly but also monthly and it's part of our security of supply do we want also to have provision uh previsibility on our facility over one year you know and prov probably batteries will not be enough to do so so we need different kind of solution for this um, security of supply that we aim for also in europe uh, it's decarbonization on one way and, and security of supply and I think I would just like to get back to what we said before about having more a planification approach at your level, which is really missing in a way. 
and also the, the sector coupling that was the approach also before, for example, when you phase out fossil, what, what how it impacts the grid, you know, necessary investments, when you electrify, what you know, what do you need also to, to as a backup? And at ENGIE, you know, we, we very much think that we need still a bunch of uh, green molecules and green electrons, um, and renewable electrons, renewable molecules, and, and they will both be needed, you know, to for to a resilient system. And those molecules, those green molecules, can help also the power system by greening, you know, flexible production as well. So it's a, uh, um, so that's the, that's a bunch of solution indeed. Um. Okay. Now there's, let's talk a bit about this flexible generation with um, the, the power plants. Um, there's of course always the suspicion that this whole argumentation is used to just prolong the use of fossil fuel uh, technology and that we maintain a gas grid um, just to uh, keep on using fossil gas. Now, if, if I'm right, um, Angie uh, does have a, a project, uh, in fact, I think it's with, with, the, with the Siemens in, in France where you try a hydrogen turbine um, using that. Um, are you aware, do you know anything about that project? Or? Yeah. So I think going back to, to what you said, um, I mean, you know, as a company, uh, if you have to decarbonize and get rid of your assets, it's simple, you sell your assets. I mean, you just decommission them. Huh? I mean, <laughs> the question is, what do we bring, you know, uh, as services to the system? It's much more difficult to stay in and, and to actually provide what is needed to decarbonize. Um, so uh, I think on, 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 on the project to green those CCGTs, of course, we have projects to use hydrogen. Uh, but also biomethane. Uh, there are renewable gases that can be produced also in Europe, and we can use them as a backup, you know, uh, for those CCGTs that will help secure the system. But we don't still have the business case for it. Um, it's still cheaper to run on, on, on fossil gas. Uh, even for CCGTs, as you know, uh, if we don't have capacity mechanism support, there is no market uh, incentive to keep them. That's why there will be so many gigawatts being decommissioned in the next years. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are, we are testing many possibilities. Uh, we see a lot of potential. Also, there, there are some CCS uh, uh, possibilities as well. Um, so, but still, it's not really, uh, you know, market ready. I think that w what you mentioned, the costs are in, indeed a, a very important thing because then we are at market design, how we shape uh, the markets and where are the prices uh, incentivizing that. Now, thinking about decarbonizing the technology indeed um, i think the the point is um it's still much cheaper to use the fossil fuel and that's why this is done uh with regard to um, the gas power generation but um do you think it's realistic that we will bring prices uh at a level where uh, we can decarbonize uh, this technology where it makes sense christoph Maybe you as an economist? <laughs> it's, it's hard to say, but if you, maybe some top of my head, some, some, some number crunching. Yeah? So we had, or we had seen in a, in a couple of months, the, the, the forwards for LNG imports, they were like 50 euros per megawatt hours and the very high prices for fossil gas. No? And then if you say um, you, you, you need um, uh, roughly 0.2 certificates per megawatt hour, which you want, that means if you have a CO2 price of 100 euros, you add another 20 on that. Huh? So with that price, you end up with 70. Now gas prices go down again. Maybe they, uh, they not, never go down back to the pre-Russian crisis prices, but LNG imports uh, become a little bit cheaper over time. But at the same time, LNG pri um, CO2 prices will go up. Uh, so if we're talking about we're ending up uh, a fossil import plus some CO2 penalty, which is likely to increase uh, if, if the allowed volumes go down with the EU ETS, uh, and you end up with something like 70, 80, 90 uh, euros or up to 100 euros per megawatt hour fossil. For that money, you can also provide in the longer term blue hydrogen. You can provide pretty soon already biomethane uh, at, at that cost. So there is a way, and uh, depending on the CO2 price signal, the gap is not that as big as it might appear. So the, the cheap fossil gas times are over anyway. Uh, so you get some extra LNG premium on that. And then the CO2 price kicks in. And um, you always have to obviously the risk of policy intervention, which we see in the capped uh, CO, um, CO2 prices in the heating sector. Uh, there you will, at least in Germany, you have a price cap until 2026. Uh, but if these price signals from the CO2 market really are set free, 
then there will be painful enough and they will lift the fossil plus CO2 uh, penalty in a region where you can work with green gases. Uh, um, the question is when does it happen, how quick is it, will there be trust by uh, green hydrogen providers that, that there will be a large market if we call hydrogen the champagne uh, and we must use it only where we can't avoid and it's a very small market, then people will not invest. If you tell them this is the future, uh, then people all over the world, uh, we have already now um, uh, improvements here and there, uh, start investing. Then you have like uh, good initiatives like H2 Global, uh, where you have some coordination. We might have them some proper certification. Then these green gases markets globally can, uh, can evolve and can be cost competitive. May I add to that, Ralph? Sure. Um, and completely uh, agree with, with your points here. And, and I think from, from Wärtselar perspective and what we see also when we, when we do our own power system modeling across the world is that it, it, you know, it, it will be possible to decarbonize you know, in time um, fossil gas or dispatchable generation currently running on gas. Like, like you said here earlier, it's not, it's not the gas. It's, it can run on multiple fuels, but, but to, um, to decarbonize that with renewable fuels but, and, and there's a but here, and, and, and that's our view that, that they're running pretty much sort of uh, flat because we have a need for that energy. Now, that's huge volumes to try to decarbonize that, and that's, that's sort of very costly. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, sort of your study, was it 8% that sort of flexible generation by 2050 would, would provide of the uh, kind of annual terawatt hours and so on? That's more the kind of level of percentage that, that it's probably feasible. Um, to, to, to decarbonize with, with carbon neutral fuels. Um, but how these gas plants operate will, will change. Now, there could be renewable drought periods or Dunkel Flaute, where indeed for a week or so they, they sort of need to run quite a lot. Uh, but most of the years, uh, or most of the time during the year, they will run for shorter bursts. You know, that could be an hour here and there to, to fit in, um, you know. Um, a deficit in, in, in wind production. It could be sort of ramping for a couple of hours in the morning and the evening to uh, address the sort of duck curve, which is becoming a canyon curve uh, problem. Um, or it could be even, you know, if there's a, a market with incentives for it, you know, starting up for five minutes, running, catching a price peak, provided that really expensive needed energy, and then shutting down. Uh, and then the volumes of, of gas that we're talking about are completely different. It's not huge volumes running like this, it's smaller volumes just coming in exactly when needed. Uh, and that's also, of course, much less from a, an emissions perspective. And those volumes of gas are, are then easier to, to decarbonize. But we also got to shift the mindset of what gas is. It's not going to be baseload when we have renewables. It's going to be short bursts of balancing when, whenever needed. Yeah, I think that's an important point to remember. Um, it's not going to be base load anymore. I think there is a consensus widely on that. But now that brings us exactly to the challenge uh, of the market design because such an investment does not sound very attractive if that plant operates. I think in your study you talk about 850 to 1,000 something hours per year. How does the operator earn the money uh, and uh, find that investment attractive to to do that. So um, I think that's that's one of the challenges. And there we have two options in my understanding. One is the energy only market to say, well, if prices are high enough, um, you still can earn the money or you pay for providing that uh, flexibility to the system, that capability to the system. Now, um, are there any views that you would like to express on, on, on that? Does it work? Maybe, uh, Dorothee, the question to you, does it work to build uh, a power plant and earn money with it if it's running only a thousand hours? Yeah. No, absolutely, you, you're right. Huh? So it's the cost of uh, security of supply that we, we agree to, to pay, actually. Uh, and no, and that's why we think in the market design revision proposed by the Commission, this question is not addressed uh, in, you know, in the right way. There is specific, there are specific products, you know, to uh, for flexibility, like peak shaving products and everything that we we think won't really address the issue. 
Um, and then on the other hand, the Commission didn't want to open the, the capacity mechanism box again <laughs> uh, because of uh, its difficulty to talk about this among member states. But the reality is that um, it's very difficult to contract a capacity mechanism because it's uh, stated at, at national level, so it has to be designed in a way that is agreed with the Commission. And also what we see in our experience is Belgium is quite um, meaningful is that the way they are designed sometimes are not uh, are not good enough to attract investors because, as you said, the energy-only market is not sufficient to, to really incentivize investments. Um, sometimes the cost is too, I mean, the, the, the price provided is too low, the, the costs, eligible costs are not, you know, uh, wide enough, or uh, there is uncertainty on the CO2 price, or, you know, many things that, you know, happen that there, there is uh, not, uh, not no bidding uh, uh, companies, you know, in the process. So. Um, so it needs to be addressed, and as you said, probably it's uh, in between, so remuneration of the capacity of the capex, but also remuneration of the, the greening of, of those flexible assets, so more support to the opex, and we think that dispatchable power agreements, uh, as it yeah, they're being put in place in the UK, could be a solution as well to incentivize also the use of alternative uh, energy in those uh, CCGTs or, um, uh, or else, but it's actually not addressed. What we see is that the re at, at the Parliament, this question is being, you know, uh, uh, put uh, on the table. Uh, it's being discussed am among member states, but yeah, we don't really see um, a proper uh, answer to that uh, in the proposal. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra, I think that th you you see as a TSO the challenge that there's there might not be enough um flexible generation units available when when you need them to to stabilize the grid and i think your your company has thought about how can you support investments in time with with a, a concept that you recently published maybe you just give us an idea of what what's behind that concept right um before that i will <laughs> say that i completely completely agree with your um, insight regarding the, the current reform because I think it is a kind of a the elephant in the room as well. What is the role of the capacity mechanisms? Do we still trust in the energy only market? For that I have an answer but uh, I think it is we just leave it to discussion still. But this, this hasn't been addressed in the, the current market reform. And because of that, um, we feel that there is an urgent need for these incentive mechanisms, not in 2030 and in, in 2030, but now. And because of the situation already uh, described a little bit in Germany with the phase out of coal and, and nuclear, and uh, this uh, this balance uh, uh, between north and south, we have this uh, problem right now. The, 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 the system is, uh, the grid is under stress. And for that, we're putting forward a, a mechanism to really ramp up the uh, building of new reliable capacity, um, making use of guaranteed annual payments. And you can think of, think of uh, you can think of it as a financial incentive, which guarantees uh, annual payments for uh, power plants, um, th which will deliver certain uh, network services, which we will forecast uh, and, and so on. So with that, with this approach, we think that we can implement it really quick because of course we will have a kind of a capacity mechanism uh, will be also an option, but this will take a lot, uh, a lo longer time, a really longer time. So we think that this approach could be easier and quicker to implement. Um, our calculations show that the, the, the cost, the additional cost for the system will be really low or even zero because these network services are already um, are actually needed. And um, a really important and for us crucial point is that the power plants will make uh, will make uh, will provide network services. So um, we'll be happy to provide more information, uh, detailed information, if someone needed. Those those network services you're talking about, that's the ancillary services uh, providing. Um, yeah, uh, inertia or uh, frequency control. We are, we are also looking at different uh, 
aspects. For instance, uh, redispatch would be one of them. But of course, it is about the location where the system need the, need need those need those services. So yes, it would be different uh, kind of services. And if I understood you well, then that in your eyes would be sufficient even without capacity mechanisms to be in place, just the market income plus those payments to kind of support a, a, a good investment plan. That's right? correct. That's correct. Because we're, what we are doing uh, with this approach is making those uh, revenues bankable. We are giving the guarantee and uh, that way to, to make it to make them uh, bankable. And um, um, well, um, we also, I think that the results uh, will be published uh, um, soon, at least in German, it's in German already out, but we also did some calculations to really look at the business case uh, for different kinds of plants. And the uh, results show that uh, the disincentive could really make the, uh, uh, at the time of the, uh, of the decision, of the investment decision, it is relevant and, and could actually um, trigger uh, an investment in, the, for instance, a CCGT plan um, in, the, in, the, in the southwest, south of Germany. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you, you also talked about the specific needs that you have uh, for a, a certain part of, of the grid. And I think one of the discussions when we discuss capacity mechanism is always that some people fear this is just paying for capacity uh, regardless if is it matching the needs of the system is it providing the flexibility and indeed i would say there is a difference between flexibility and pure capacity and i, I know that at Wetzler you you thought a bit about this uh, capability approach i think you call it yeah in, in a way i think what we what we want to highlight is is that the capacity payment can be a bit of a blunt tool um so again, you know, how do you link it back to the actual needs of the system and uh, and the jobs that need to sort of get done? Um, because if you if you sort of pay for capacity, you may end up sort of having a lot of plants that are only able to do this, and none of the plants that are actually able to do this, um, and 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 so on. So so I think either having more products in a market that sort of fit the bill when it comes to the jobs that need to be done. Of course, you could still, in theory, utilize a capacity mechanism, but um, sort of just link it to the capabilities needed of the technology uh, needed. So, and uh, that could be structured in different ways. And this is actually a global topic that I've, I've talked about also, also outside, outside Europe. So, I mean, you could have flexibility requirements, you know, really going into the operational parameters and, and dynamics of the plant, you know, what's the needed startup time and what are the other sort of technical requirements for the services that, that need to, uh, that need to do. And, and you could sort of tier it. So, uh, again, making creating this link to the jobs that need to be done in the system, so that then you know if you have plants that uh, can run, you know the Dunkelflaute, you have plants that sort of fulfill this certain balancing need. You have plants that can start up in two minutes or less. You have plants that are already perhaps operating and can directly provide frequency support. Um, I think it's important that if there are capacity mechanisms, that they're also tiered in a sense that. Um, the more flexibility you have and the more jobs a certain plan can get done, um, also the higher the, the incentives to actually send the right kind of signal uh, to the market. And I think we need to take a view towards the future on that as well, um, because of course we have the situation today, but the the requirements uh, and the sort of the, the, the fast response ones so probably will just grow with, with more renewables, so sort of structuring that correctly. So, Christoph, is that maybe the way forward to say we need to define the, the, the flexibility needs more precisely instead of saying, oh, it's just we, we pay for um, pure capacity, but we define for the specific grid the flexibility needs and then find a price for that. And regardless of the technology that than can offer, uh, but we don't make it technology specific, but kind of capability specific. Yes, I would I would agree that we should do uh, be technology agnostic, and that we would sh should be more precise on what type of flexibility we need and where. Uh, we heard from Sander there is a big difference whether the power plant is in Kiel or in Munich, uh, and and we, we need them we need them in Munich or not in downtown Munich, but in Bavaria. So, <laughs> so the, the 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 problem is we have to like give the signals. Um, I'm personally 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic what capacity markets uh, uh, say because uh, I, I can, as long as we give the the signals via the market, uh, via an energy only market, and we we really have the the um, uh, the, um, the price signal and live with the with the margins and the very high prices, then it can work. But if we interfere in this market, then we need something else, uh, and then we ca can be a well done capacity market can be better than a poorly done energy only market or the other way around in the end we have to make sure we get the signals of scarcity to the investors huh? and um, that's i think where we are currently having a, a, a gap in some time huh? for example inertia is not really paid in in germany we have the question how do we have locational signals um, for the power plants and there are examples not like frequency control products huh? the, there are these products you have a clear pre-qualification phase you know what to deliver under which condition and then you can do it and then you have the energy only market if you can trust in it, it is working. If you can't trust in it, if you don't have locational signals somewhere, no, then we are lacking some coordination. No? And that's kind of the, the thing we have to get on a European basis, no? because it doesn't help if we just uh, heal it here and there, and then we have cross-border in, uh, in interactions. No? For example, if we now start 25 gigawatts in Germany, that's maybe nice for Germany, but it may ruin the prices in France or in Austria and then trigger a problem there. Uh, so we have to make sure that we do this in a consistent way in a regional um, consideration and not just bits and pieces here and there. That sounds quite ambitious, honestly, to define that locally and then have a, a uh, European-wide cooperation. Uh, Sandra, can you imagine this to work? I think that... Um, a kind of cartonization is always possible, of course. Harmonization is always good, but uh, I would say that at a high level, uh, the, the main, the main uh, aspects, the goals, the targets, and so on. I think that would be uh, quite um, not straightforward, but could be easy to agree upon. Uh, the issue or the problem begins when you try to really dictate you have to do this and everywhere uh, across Europe. That, that is just not possible. It doesn't work like that because the countries, the systems, they are structurally different. So no solution, one solution really concrete, described or detailed into the last detail, to the last point cannot be implemented over all Europe. And I think that that is um, guilt for, for any kind of, of system that you try to implement in Europe. I think that it is uh, good to, to respect that, to take into account the, 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 uh, the, uh, the countries, the, the systems are different. But still, I think that a, a certain degree of harmonization uh, is always good for, for cooperating. Yeah. Maybe one more question directly to you. If, if we look at what we have now in the electricity market regulation on capacity mechanisms there's this preference for strategic reserves outside operating outside of the market so under your responsibility as as tso how, how do you see that concept uh, well, as you know, the, the purpose of the uh, strategic reserves is to is as a backup, really as a backup, as a last uh, option, a last measure, and kind of an emergency situation. So those reserves that we have are not intended to participate in the in the in the markets, as you mentioned before. They are outside, and they, we keep it there for to use them uh, in, in the case of need, uh, particularly in Germany, uh, in the case, for instance, when in, in day ahead. Uh, cannot meet the demand. So in that case, I would say that it's a, a, a good um, um, uh, a tool to have, to have this backup. Uh, but the, there are certain, um, you cannot make it too large. You cannot pay it because it is, if you have a large or a larger um, capacity outside of the market that would be too inefficient and also too expensive so a strategic reserve has certain uh, limits to to how, how large can it be and over that limit it is just too too expensive to have and then you have to think about other other instruments or mechanism that uh, that also participate in the markets uh, in a more open way okay i think we have five minutes left for that discussion so whatever point you would still like to make that's now the opportunity if if we missed one point in, in our discussion that you would like to highlight any thing any um well boy you seem to be all happy uh so uh in, in, in well, that maybe just to, to build on your point point there sandra because i think that was a good one so 
again, and, and we've been at this topic, right? So, so just earmarking a certain job for a certain technology, that's when you sort of get it sitting stagnant and, and we actually end up overbuilding. Um, you know, also on the on the backup capacity, if it's just supposed to do one job and, and then sit there. So uh, instead having sort of a pragmatic system, um, a system where the firm assets that we do invest in are allowed to do multiple things and get perhaps some revenues um, from, from multiple sources. Um, and I think that's, that's also a great way to incentivize technology uh, that can do multiple jobs uh, and play in multiple markets. And of course, as a as a system, we'll, we'll end up with the most efficient solution. So I think that was a great point. If we let the market work, yes, then <laughs> it will be. Okay, so many thanks for that very interesting discussion um, to all of you for contributing to this. Um, I'm not gonna summarize that, but I would suggest um, that will be done now by, by Sven Rias. But a big applause for uh, you as panelists here. And, uh, I would suggest you move down there back again before Sven takes the word because it's quite narrow here. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for this panel discussion. I think it was a great discussion and thanks a lot to all of you to participate. A very warm welcome also from my side. I think we've we've learned or we've heard a lot today about flexibility and how to uh, approach the future of the energy system. And I think the most one of the most important takeaway is that we have a challenge and that we have a gap of 200 gigawatt of of, of power. This has to be solved somehow. And, and and my main takeaway is that there is no silver bullet. Uh, we have to be technology open. I think this is important. And I think it's important that we recognize that we have a lot of young, intelligent, innovative people in, in Europe, which will definitely find solutions. And we should not limit them in, in, in setting boundary conditions, which will limit us in the solution. So we have to be technology open. I think this is my most important takeaway that, and I'm pretty sure that we will find a solution because in the past we did find solutions. And, and also uh, important is that we have to intensify or incentivize the the technologies because somebody has to build this power plants this 200 gigawatt power plants and if there is no incentive nobody will invest so we have to find a way to 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 yeah to set up a boundary condition that industry and and the utilities build up this power plants and also in the industry it's like this if the boundaries are not set we will not invest in new technologies we have everything in our pocket, engines, turbines, storage in technologies, batteries. But if there is no investment, if there is no market, industry will not invest. So we have to set up the boundary conditions that industry will invest. And I think this is also very important to, to recognize. And, and maybe we should also rephrase the, the market. It's, not, it's, it's maybe capacity is not the right word. word. It's maybe, it may be better to talk about capabilities. To, to 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 pay or to yeah to find a way that there's a business case for for providing the capability to to ensure a flexible system in the future and i think it's it's we are all aware of the fact that we want to reach the 1.5 degree climate goal and for this we need renewables but we also need uh, flexible power and 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 we as as members of AO turbines and and origin, we, we we can provide the technology, and it's not fossil technology. We can run our system with non-fossil fuels, but we need a grid for this. We need the infrastructure, hydrogen, carbon dioxide infrastructure. Also, CCS may play a major role in the in decarbonizing the existing assets. So, um, I think it's a challenging time. And it's an exciting time, but I'm pretty sure that we will, at the end of the day, uh, find a way to to achieve our goals. But we have to be technology open, and we have to be not, and we do not have to limit ourselves in the technology. I think this is important. Yeah, I th I would like to thank again to uh, uh, to uh, to Catherine. She she already left, and I, I think she she gave a nice flavor of the of the thoughts of the commission 
And also, of course, I would like to thank Christoph and his team in, of, of Frontier Economics for this great study. I think it's a it's really great study and it came to the right si time. And, and I hope that a lot of people will will go through it because it's really fruitful. And you can find the the study on the on the internet pages of EO Turbines and Eugen and also at Frontier Economics. Please download it. It's really worth going through it. By that, I would like to, to close it. And thanks to all the participants on the on the screens. I hope you did have a exciting two hours. And I also would like to thank all the participants in the room and, and invite you to the lunch. Those on the screen have a nice lunch or a coffee. Thank, thanks a lot. Hope to see you soon.